بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علم Occupation is revelation. He is the great angelic ambassador of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we will learn is that Gabriel on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas and others is going to take the Quran over this 23 year period from what? Well, from a house called Baytul Izza. Baytul Izza, which is the Kaaba of the first heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. Verily, we revealed it, what is it, the Quran, on the night of the grand decree, which on the dominant opinion was the 17th of Ramadan in that year, the 17th of Ramadan in that year, that Allah revealed it on one the night of power. What did He reveal the Quran? But we know that the Quran does not what, necessarily what, come down on one night. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to? Although we have an opinion by the great Imam whose name is Sahal, Bin Abdullah Tustari radiallahu ta'ala on the great Imams of the Salaf, who's of the opinion that that verse referred to the revelation of the Quran into the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all in one go. And then Gabriel extracts it from the heart of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, over 23 years. That's the opinion of the great Imam Sahab bin Abdullah Tustari. But the dominant opinion that we hear from the Imams of the Sahaba, like Abdullah ibn Abbas, is that the entire Quran is going to be revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Lawh al Mahfuz into Bayt al Izza. Bayt al Izza is the Kaaba of what? Of the twin, of the Kaaba of the first heaven. And that's the Kiram and Barara, as we hear in Surah Al Abasa, Kiram and Barara are those noble angels that were our guardians of the Quran and revelation in the first heaven. And then Gabriel will take the Quran over 23 years from the house, Kiram al Barara, the great noble scribes, and bring it down to the Messenger of Allah over 23 years. What we want to refer to here is that in the first instance when the Quran is initially revealed, those first five verses of Surah Al-Iqra, Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. Okay, those first five verses. That that is the only Quran that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi that he receives and braces from Gabriel. Then the Quran is going to cease on the dominant opinion, and there are several opinions, but the dominant opinion as is clarified in the Muslim of Ahmed in this tradition, three years. There's an absolute cessation of revelation. No revelation comes from Gabriel. But the reality is that it's a changing of the gods. Okay? That Gabriel will ascend, and as we see in the tradition, Israfil, the great angel Israfil, will what? Descend and will remain with the Prophet ﷺ in order to take him from prophecy to messengership. Okay, to rear him further to the point that now he is ready to receive the great mission, the greatest mission of all, to be that great and universal messenger, Rasul il al alamin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wasallam. But what's important is the nature of what the nature in the Prophet sallallahu receives. Can you alimu al kalima shay? As in the tradition here, that Israfil used to teach the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al kalima, the word was shay. And the entity, okay? And that's a great insight into the nature of the prophetic nurturing. Because we're going to see something similar with Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam in that war, in time immemorial with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Israfil is the grand angel of what? He has two primary war occupations in the heavens. The first occupation of Israfil is that he is the angel of the horn. Israfil is that angel what? who has the horn, the neck of either nufiq of his sur. The one who's going to blow the horn that ushers in the final moment, the destruction of the entire creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Israfil who blows the horn. And the blowing of the horn will even bring about the destruction of Israfil in and of himself. Gabriel in and of himself. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, in and of himself sallallahu wa sallam. The entire creation with very few exceptions is going to be rendered into a state of obliteration, a state of oblivion. And thereafter it will be brought back 40 years later, as the Prophet has said, by Israfil once again, who's going to be what? Well, he's going to, oh, going to blow the horn the second time. That's one of the great professions of Israfil, but he has another profession which many may not be aware of if they haven't had a, 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 a study of Aqidah, for instance, is that Sayyidina Israfil is also the angel of the Lawh al Mahfuz. He is the guardian angel of the grand tablet in the heavens. 
the tablet in which everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for his cosmos must first and foremost appear in the Lawh al Mahfur. So he is privy to that type of knowledge, Sayyidina Israfil. So his descent to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa for three entire years is a very important descent because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is going to be reared to the point where he himself sallallahu alayhi wa is going to encompass the knowledge of the Lawh al Mahfur. That's the other hadith in the, in the, in the Musnad of Ahmad radiallahu ta'ala an, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when when he's, he, he's delayed for Fajr, he's delayed for Fajr prayer, and then when he comes, he tells his Sahaba, the companions, that what, what has delayed him. And what, would, what had delayed him is that in the dream state and the dreams of prophets are real. That um, prophecy is gone and all that remains are glad tidings. Or what are glad tidings, or messenger of God? A true dream. True dreams are windows. In other hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, in other hadith al-Bukhari, it's 146 of what? Of prophecy, the true dream. And the dreams of prophets, all prophets, are real. Revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what was the dream of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Ra'aytu rabbi fi ahsan of surah. That I saw my Lord. I saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as plain as daylight. Okay, that's the hadith of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. فَسَأَلَنِي رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ That my Lord, if the Lord of Might asked me, مَاذَا يَتَخَاصَمُونَ عَنَ الْمَلُ الْأَعْلَى He asked the Prophet Sallallahu what are the heavenly company discussing at this moment in time? Who is the heavenly company? The angels, Gabriel, Mikhail, Israfil, Azrael, the, the great mighty souls of the prophets of Ibrahim, of Musa, etc. That's called the Mala, al Mala al A'la, okay, the supreme assembly in the heavens. What are they discussing? Allah SWT asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He said, La a'rufu ya Rabb. I don't know, my Lord. Then the, Pro- the Prophet Islam says in words which are what well, considered from the mutashabihat, them ambiguous sort of statements we find in the Quran or in the Sunnah, as Imam Shafi'i radiallahu ta'ala and says, we believe in it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for it to believe in. What were the words? Then Allah placed his hand inside of my chest. Until I felt the coolness of his extremities. Okay? Then I came into knowledge of everything. Everything. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to ask the Prophet a series of questions. And then the Prophet begins to answer every question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him. Okay, so the rearing of the Prophet Kalima was Shay. What it ultimately is going to look at is the relationship. Between words in their primordial form, I mean words before alteration or deviation of words, and how words relate to the entities that what they represent. That is the great knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled inside Sayyidina Adam, وَعَلَّمَ Adam al asmaa كُلَّهَا That Allah taught Adam the names of everything in its entirety. And those names are not just abstract words that have no correlation to the entities that they represent, but they are in fact knowledge of the entities as represented by the names that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately gave every aspect of his creation in pre-eternity, Jalla fil That knowledge was distilled in Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, and that process is going to be repeated by Sayyidina Israfil with regards to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi and inshallah ta'ala we'll just have some type of ittila' some type of inshallah um, base awareness of how words relate to their entities especially those entities and words names that surrounded the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam the first nature of the messenger is Allah Allah this is Rasulullah this is the messenger of Allah this is that great being who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inscribed his appellage on the arsh, the very arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most supreme being in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is those very words that as we see in, in, in a tabarani on, on, on Sayyidina Ka'b al-Ahbar, the hadith of Ka'b al-Ahbar, the great tabi'i who speaks as a tabi'i, but what he speaks about, he could not have knowledge of it except if he took it from Senate. 
from whom the Sahaba who must have took it from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the opinion of whom the people of Ahadith that when you see the companions or you see the Tabi'een speak about things that take place beyond the veil in the world of the unseen that they must have taken that with Senate from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I.e., although the Senate is going to be what somewhat severed because it's a statement of Sayyidina Kaab radiallahu ta'ala and Ahbar. Kaab al Ahbar is one of the great students of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala and oh, but that knowledge, where did he get it from? What did he speak about? He spoke about what the verse in, in Surah Al Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What talaqa Adam al Asma'a kullaha. That Allah said that we talaqa Adam al kalimat min Rabbi he fataba ali. Afwan that Adam talaqa embraced words such that Allah turned towards him, accepted his repentance. Saint Adam when he was when he transgressed quote unquote in the heavens the order the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And so what are the words that Saint Adam embraced? Uh, what were the words that he embraced, or what were the words, as in another one of the Qira'at, the Sahih, the, one of the, the, the canonical readings of the Quran, what were the words that embraced Adam? It's two readings, one that Adam embraced the words, and the other that the words sought out Adam, embraced Adam, which is a more powerful reading. And Sayyidina Ka'b al Ahbar relates that Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam, that he says that he's, the words he used was due to the virtue of Muhammad. The word Muhammad, Sayyidina Ka'b al-Ahbar says in Tabarani. And then Allah SWT asked Sayyidina Adam, وَأَيْنَ عَرَفْتَ مُحَمَّدًا From where did you know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And Sayyidina Adam begins to speak by saying, I gazed upon the arsh and I saw the words, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And that I knew that never would you co-fix any name that represents an entity with your name, except if that name, that entity, was great with you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Sayyidina Adam, Naam, Ya Adam. Yes, of course, O Adam. Ma if it was not for him, I would never have created you in the first place. That's the hadith you'll find in, in Tabarani's um, tradition, Rabbi Allah ta'ala, the great Imam. So here that the primary nature of the Prophet sallallahu is Allah, Allah. And what's going to be one of the beautiful things we see in the Quran, as the Quran natures the Prophet sallallahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself, not by Allah, or not by Ar-Rahman, these two great names, most consider them the two greatest names of what that deity is worshipped in truth. Allah, Allah, Ar rahman Call upon Allah or call upon Ar-Rahman. These are the two primary names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah does not what? Refer to himself by those names in the beginning of the Quran, the first revelations. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the interesting term, Ar-Rabb, Rabb, Bismi Rabbika, uh, in the name of your Lord Rabb. And the word Rabb in the Arabic language is what is what's the most precise word we could translate possibly. The word Rabb is the nature of because Rabb in the Arabic language from the same term we're going to get the word Tarbiya from, to nature or to raise. So the Rabb, the Lord, is the one who what nurtures or raises. Imam al raza Suhani, one of the greatest commentators and lexicographers of the Quran, his name is al raza al-Suhani, he's one of the greatest influences upon whom Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, al raza Suhani in his book, great book called Mufradat al-Quran, the lexicon of the Quran, when he, when he defines the word Rabb, he said it is to take something shay'an for shay'an, step by step, stage by stage, to nurture something in degrees, until they reach a state or a point of perfection. And that's what the word Rabb implies with regards to the Messenger of God, وسلم, that it is Allah primarily who is taking him in degrees. And he said, Verily I am sojourning unto my Lord, he will guide me. We looked at that verse previously, that's the verse of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, Ibrahim himself, the great archetype and the one, Ashba. Biya in Sahih al-Bukhari, the one who, who most resembles me, the Messenger of God وسلم, said inwardly and outwardly, ذاحبون إلى ربي I am what? Sojourning or moving unto my Lord, 
my nature, say yeah, Dini, and he is the one who will ultimately guide me or nurture me unto him. So what we have to place this in context is that the nature is Allah, and what we are looking at are the intermediaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ordinarily manifest that nurturing or that nurturing through. Ay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works, has created a world of intermediaries, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can work without intermediary or through intermediary or despite intermediary Jalla fil Ula that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but what we gaze at are those people that Allah al Jabbar subjugated in order to take care of the nurturing of his prophet. And there are gonna be inshallah ta'ala three main we look at one of the angels and we will refer to Israfil but the angels are there from the get-go in multiple traditions that from the moment the Prophet وسلم, is born the angels are also present then also the second are the great mothers of the Prophet Sallallahu who has several mothers because the mother is one, ultimately the one who nurtures him Sallallahu Alaihi the Umm as opposed to the Walida. He only has one Walida, Amina bint Wahab. Amina is the, is the biological mother of the Prophet Sallallahu but he has several mothers and he used that term Ummi Ba'da Ummi. That is my mother after my mother and he used that term to refer to several of the great women who surrounded him. These are some of them. And the, without a doubt, the most important of them, Amina bint Wahab is the biological mother of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alaihi And ultimately, she is going to be involved in the life of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alaihi Obviously, through the period of gestation, his nine and a half months that he's in the womb of his mother, and that is sort of very, very, very significant. Even we find now in sort of modern in medical studies, one has come out recently about the impact just the voice of the mother has upon the child in the, in the womb. Just the voice that the child in the womb is able to recognize the voice of the mother and it's influenced by the voice of the mother. So we should never negate nine and a half months that the Prophet ﷺ stayed in that womb, that blessed womb. And when we consider, because many of us don't, those who are raised in an environment that ultimately bequeaths or nurtures us to have really bad adab with the Prophet ﷺ and his family. Bad adab, adab, the type of adab that it would be yani, yani, unconsiderable in that first generation. When they refer, when they, those who looked at the family of the Messenger of Allah, like Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr ta'ala an, who said that it's more beloved to me that I maintain ties with the family of the Messenger of Allah wasallam, than to maintain ties with my own family. That's what Abu Bakr al-Siddiq ta'ala an, says. So we should consider that when the ulama can care, can care, absolute concurrence, no disagreement, that what the place where the body of the Prophet wasallam, now resides, Inside of Medina Tul Manawara Taiba, Yani now reside is the greatest space in the cosmos, they say. No one disagrees upon that when you look at sacred space. And that's Earth to Rab. And that is great by virtue of the fact that it holds, it contains the body of the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what about the womb of Amina bin Wahab? It has no significance whatsoever. It was just there. And there's no greatness about that womb. That is something that's completely erroneous. And we we, we, we we to only read a really brilliant book, this thick, nine tracts upon the what by Imam Abdurrahman al Suyuti, nine whole tracts, Risalat, Rasail, upon the mother and father of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi then maybe we become somewhat aware of how great they were in the eyes of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and therefore in the eyes of Allah Jalla fil Ula. So Amin Amin bin Wahab has a very important role in the first nine and a half months, the gestation of the descent of the soul of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa that great soul. You see, that great soul is going to descend to, or to, a, to a, a wicked place, a filthy place. Saying Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah says that is the soul that is the size of the entire cosmos. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah radiallahu ta'ala an says, okay, and then she's going to play a, a definitive role in what? In the fifth to the sixth year of the life of the messenger of God. And that's really all the role she plays in terms of nature, the messenger. The next one is Suwayb al-Aslamiyah. And Thuwayb al-Aslamiyah, we'll just look at them briefly. Thuwayb al-Aslamiyah is what? She is one of the what? The, the murdi'ah. The murdi'ah is what? Is, the, is a witness, the one who gives this what? Laban, this milk unto what? The infant child. Okay, and she is one of the first and some are of the opinion that she is the, the first, although the dominant opinion that the first 
witness of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his mother Amina. Or the summer of the pinna is Thuwaiba al Aslamiya. Thuwaiba al Aslamiya. Okay, and she's going to be somebody who's very, very important also. Okay, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, He says that what? That which um, kinship forbids, milk also forbids. I threw enough rada'at of drinking of the milk of a wa of a wetness, she becomes your mother by the sharia mutahara. And nobody disputes on that whatsoever inside any of the schools of jurisprudence. So she becomes the biological mother of the messenger of God through milk, we could call it biological, through milk. And obviously here, whoever gave her the milk, I hear the husband, whoever gave her the milk, becomes his biological father. And those children from those two become the biological brothers and sisters through milk of the Messenger Sallallahu The next one we're going to see is, is the greatest and probably the most important of them is Halima ibn Abu Dhu'ayb al-Sa'adiyya. It's Halima Sa'adiyya. And she is going to be the most important because that's Ru'i to be Bani Sa'ad. That it was thrust into the depths of my soul when I was amongst, when I, whilst I was amongst Banu Sa'ad. And that's Halima al-Sa'adiyya. Halima Sa'adiyya. Okay, five years she's going to have with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that formative period. The third, or the fourth, is a Shafa'a bin Amr bin Auf. And Shafa'a, her great role, the greatest role that she has, is that she is the actual what, midwife. She is the first face the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi is going to see in this war, in this world. First face, Shafa'a. And she is the mother of whom? Shafa'a. She's the mother of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. The mother of the great companion, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, this is his mother, and she is the other one who receives the Messenger of God وسلم, in what? In creation. And she is the one who what? That it's because of the miraculous events that take place at birth, she later recounts, that's why I became Muslim. You see, when he declared prophecy, I just had to remember how he came into the world, the great miraculous events that took place, and she was one of the first people to become Muslim, Shafa, the mother of the great companion, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. From amongst them is Um Ayman Baraka, the daughter of Tha'laba. Okay, Baraka, whose name is Um Ayman, and she is again one of the most significant, some would have it as the most significant. Why? Because she is the only person who is, of all of these women, who's going to be with the Prophet ﷺ from the day he is born to the day he dies. She's going to have 63 years alongside the Messenger ﷺ, and she was one of the only companions who could be absolutely forward, and she would treat him like a son. She would speak as if, I, I am your mother, and she's from the wet nurses of the Messenger of God, وسلم, but she's also the one who raised him alongside his mother. And when the, his mother dies, there's only two people with the Messenger, the Prophet, وسلم, his mother and Barakah. And when his mother dies, the Prophet is left in the hands of Barakah. And Barakah is the one who's going to raise the burial of the mother of the Prophet, وسلم, and thereafter she takes care of him until she places him in the hands of whom? Of, 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 um, of, of, of um, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather. And the last one of the great women is Fatima bint Asad, the daughter of Hashim. Fatima bint Asad, the daughter of Hashim, she is whom? She is the mother of Ali bin Abi Talib, the wife of Abu Talib, Fatima bint Asad. Really important woman, one of those ones, just like Baraka. Plus I'm called Baraka Ummi Ba'da Ummi, my mother after my mother. He also called Fatima bint Asad, my mother after my mother. And she has a unique status, unique status. We could take the hadith as an example of whom? Of um of 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 um of 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 Raitha, one of Rameitha, Rameitha, one of the great companions, women companions of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi who relates the hadith "Ihtaza limoti arsh al-Rahman" that the throne of al-Rahman shooted upon his death. Whose death? An individual called Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Okay, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, the great companion of the Ansar. And the Prophet وسلم, said, had anyone been safe from the punishment of the grave, it would be Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala. And that's someone when he died, the, yani, the throne, the outer crust of the universe is shuddering for the death of that individual. And you have to understand who he is, his importance in the seen world and the unseen world, right to the end of the universe, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Yet when he enters into the grave, he is not safe from the punishment of the grave on the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, very few are. And the ulama will debate about who they are. Uh, from amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the only one definitively mentioned is Fatima bint Asad. This great woman, the Prophet ﷺ, is called my mother after my mother. That it is what it is. It is the belief of the of the believers by the hadith which is which is sahih that Fatima bin Asad will not be punished in the grave whatsoever. Even the slightest punishment, at most received the slightest punishment, even from the great people of Allah Jalla fil Ula. Why? Because on the on her death when she died, it was the Prophet sallallahu who who carved out her lahat carved out a, a, a resting place. The lahad is when the, the shoot comes down and it goes in. That's what's called the lahad. So he carves it out and then the Prophet Sallallahu lies in the lahad himself. He lies there first and foremost. And then he calls for the body of Fatima bin Asad anha, and when he brings it down, he places it in and he's the one who seals it up. And that's going to be a, a grave that is protected by virtue of what? Of the grave not being able to touch, affect the messenger of God, That is a great and beautiful woman in his life. Okay? Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to try and inshallah, move through it as swiftly as we can. When the authority of Abu Umama, I asked, O Messenger of God, how did your, your affair begin? He replied, the prayer of my father Abraham, the glad tidings of Jesus, the son of Mary, and my mother saw light emanate from here that illuminated the palaces of the Levant. Okay? She witnesses that on the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, light comes forth from here to the point that she can see the palaces of the Levant of Sham, and in particular the palaces of Busra. Busra, which was what? Which was the capital, considered the capital of the Holy Roman Empire in the Levant. That was the capital where, where Caesar himself had his war, had his palace in the Levant, in the city of Busra. And what's going to be important about that city, as we'll hear, as we as we go through, as we looked at, we looked at it with um, with, with um, Bus, um, Buhaira, That's where Buhaira had his retreat at Busra, just outside of Busra. Uh, and that also is going to be the very first um, city in the Levant to fall. When the armies of the Sahaba head north, the first place to fall is the actual capital city of what? Of the Holy Roman Empire, the city called Busra. And, so, and a lot of the ulama relate this to that, okay? Our Lord sent unto, sent unto them a messenger, one of them who shall recite your signs to them and teach them the book and wisdom and purify them. You are the Almighty, the wise. That's the prayer of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, to which the Prophet sallam, said, I am the response to that prayer, the answer of that prayer. And give glad tidings of a message shall come after me whose name is Ahmed. That's the Bushra. He said, I am the glad tidings of, my, of Jesus, the son of Mary. Uh, I give glad tidings and give glad tidings of a message shall come after me whose name is Ahmed. Ahmed being the heavenly name of the Prophet Muhammad. And the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, Amin ibn Wahab said, when he came out of me, light emanated from me, which illuminated that which lies between the east and the west. Then he fell on the earth upon his knees, resting upon his hands. Then he clasped a handful of earth, holding on to it, raising his head towards the heavens. Okay? And some of us may believe that this is Amina, that maybe she's going through the pangs of hay, of childbirth. So maybe it was just what? It was hallucinations. Some of us may, may, may move towards that. Some of us who are, who are weak in terms of faith. But here we have, we have an objective witness who is the mother of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Okay? So she's not going through any type of what pangs of what childbirth. Is she, radiallahu ta'ala anha, on the authority of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, on the authority of his mother, Shafa, the daughter of Amr, the daughter of the son of Auf, who said, when Amina gave birth to the messenger of God, he fell into my arms and immediately began to scream, I thereby heard a voice say, May God have mercy upon you. And that's a voice of the angel, most of the angel Gabriel. Or may your Lord be merciful with you, responds to the scream of the messenger of God. Then that which lay between the east and the west was illuminated until I was able to see some of the palaces of Rome. What she means, the palaces of Rome, of the Roman Empire. The other hadith bring them together, i.e. Busra, the palaces in Busra, not the palaces in Rome in and of itself. She said, then I clothed him and lay him down. Immediately I was encompassed by darkness, fear, and began to tremble on my right side. 
I thereby hear the voice say, Where have you taken him? He replied, To the west. Thereby what afflicted me subsided on a right side. Then I was once again afflicted with fear and trembling on my left side. And thus did I hear a voice say, Where have you taken him? He replied, To the east. She said, The conversation played on my mind until God exalted be he granted him prophecy. And that's the reason why she becomes Muslim of the first people to become Muslim. And that was the only habit that the angel Gabriel and Mikhail. You can see other rewires where Gabriel and, and, and Gabriel and Mikhail are going to be the ones who when the Prophet وسلم, decides to cry, that they're the ones who are going to console him and they would witness the baby movement. They're the angels used to rock the Prophet وسلم, anytime he was disturbed by whatever he was disturbed by. Them great two angels who rear him of those natures in the formative period. Quickly we look at the wave al who is the freed slave of Abu Lahab, who nurses the Prophet from the milk of his son, Masruh, alongside two other individuals as related in Al-Bukhari, namely Hamza, the son of Abdul Muttalib, and Abu Salama Abdullah ibn Abdul Asad al makhzumi She died in the year 7 AH, and the scholars are in, are in dispute regarding whether or not she became Muslim. Okay, so, so Fawaib al aslamiya that she is going to be a slave to Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab, who is the uncle of the Prophet his name is Abdul Uzza ibn Abdul Muttalib. So he, is, he has a slave called Thuwayba al-Aslamiya. And what's going to be what important here, we see the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, is that on the birth of the Prophet وسلم, that she immediately runs to whom? To Abu Lahab, a quote-unquote master, to inform him of the news of the birth of the Prophet وسلم, to which he is so filled with joy that he says that you are free, free, Okay, he frees her immediately uh, on the basis of that. And that's why we see the hadith in Al-Bukhari, which again is to understand what it means for an individual to be happy about the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. What does it mean that for somebody to be rejoiced that the Prophet ﷺ was born? I mean, we can get into conversations about the idea or the idea of Mawlid, celebrating the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Ummah traditionally has been split upon the practice, but none of them are split upon the law, upon the causative reason why it's practiced, I rejoicing the birth of the Messenger of God ﷺ. So those who take the side that Mawlid is not something from the religion, we're doing that, that's an opinion that many of the ulama are going to have, so people can have that opinion, but you have to beware that what you don't have the opinion that I am not allowed or able or should from the dictates of the religion rejoice the birth of the Messenger of God. Otherwise, how do you understand the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where Sayyidina Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib sees in the dream state Abu Lahab, his brother, Abdul Uzza. Abbas sees his brother, Abdul Uzza. He sees him in the midst of hell, being punished in hell. And he asks him, yani, what has your Lord done with you? And he says, he's placed me in the midst of hell, in the abyss of hell, except on every Monday that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows me to suck yani, fluid from my fingers that relieves me of the punishment of the hellfire. Why? Because of the, the farh, the ecstasy I had when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was born. That's the hadith al-Bukhari which Muhammad Ismail al-Bukhari, the greatest muhaddith of all time, preserved for us to understand. And why on a Monday? Because the Prophet ﷺ was born on that blessed Monday, وسلم, in the Bukhari likewise. Why do you fast on Mondays, Ya Rasulullah? He was asked. He said, Dalikal yawm alladhi wulid tu fi. That is the day in which I was born. Born. A blessed day, which he celebrated by fasting. And Abu Lahab, the loss of the Quran, the Quran speaks for Abu Lahab. Someone who's in an eternal punishment, eternal punishment, but yet Allah relieves him of that punishment on a day of that in which the Prophet Sallallahu was born because he rejoiced when he was born, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And that's Abu Lahab. What do you think Allah Ta'ala would do with those who really rejoice? Not just when he was born, uh, one instant and then after become enemies, but they live their life rejoicing the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was born. That Allah said, where we were, where he not were, 
um, low life, if it wasn't for the Prophet وسلم, none of us would be, not a single one of us would be, something we should what, bear in, 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 consider, in take, take into consideration. Okay? That's the way that Halima, and these words, what we wanted to make mention of is, is, is some of the words, because you can look at all of these words that relate to the Prophet sallallahu like Thuwayba, like Thab, Thuwayba, you can see all of them have some type of relationship in terms of their essential being. And you cannot understand this until, unless you have a, a greater understanding of revelation, Quran, Kalam Allah, Kalimat Allah, the words of God and how words relate to entities, which is Arabian worldview, ancient worldview. Somebody who studies the Egyptian, the Medu Nature, what they call Medu Nature, what they call Europeans, called hieroglyphs, will understand that the, you know, the, the, the greatest quote unquote civilization in terms of time, historical time. There's no um, civilization that has taken a greater part of human history than Egyptian history. And that's why it plays an important role inside the Kitab of Allah, as well as the Sunnah al Mutahara also. And that their worldview, and what's been really important for us to understand, because many of us have moved the path of the Christians into believing that the Egyptians were all Taghut, they were all idolaters, which is something completely erroneous. And that's one of the ways the Quran differentiates from the Bible. That's a biblical worldview. But the Quranic worldview is now, we have the, which corresponds to Egyptian history, then you have the epoch of pharaohs, which corresponds to Egyptian history. But the pharaohs, Pharaonic Egypt, is the last dynasty of Egypt. And the dynasties before were radically different. And Allah refers to them not as pharaohs, but Malik al-Aziz. That's what Allah calls him, the mighty king. Doesn't call him a pharaoh. The what the king in the time of Yusuf. And that is one of the subtleties in the Quran, which shows the veracity of the Quran. And, 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 and it blows in the face of those Christians who claim that what? The Quran just was taken from the Bible. Well, it was taken from the Bible. How come we didn't call the what? The king in the time of Joseph, Yusuf, Pharaoh, as the Bible did. It's called Malik al-Aziz, which corresponds in, to the independent testimony of Egyptian history, what's called the hieroglyphs. Okay? And one of the things that we're going to see is that they also have this perspective about the relationship between words and entities. And that's why we hear one of the great proverbs, proverbial words in the Arabic language, that Kullu musamma lahu nasibun min ismihi, that every name thing will get a portion of its name. And that's why Qadib al Bakhna Arabi, one of the great people who spoke on how we nurture our young ones, he said that on the day of judgment, Allah Ta'ala will ask the parent about the rights of the child before the child is asked about the rights of the parent. And he said that the first right that he'll be asked about the parent is the name. The name that you gave that child. Because that's ultimately going to govern the reality of who that child becomes. Every name thing gets a portion of its name. That the name Muhammad, as an example, is not an arbitrary name that has no relationship to that great being, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but is representative of who he is. I mean, he is somebody who was in that perpetual state of glorification and praise of his Lord. That's why his names are Muhammad in the dunya and Ahmed in the other world, like Jesus, the son of Mary, the otherworldly prophet who's living, referred to him as, as Ahmed. Ahmed al Hamidin, the greatest ever to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al Bukhari Hadith Mutawatir, Yuftah Ali al Muhammad, La Tuftah Yahadin min Qabri, that what ways of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are granted to me, said in, 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 in Al Bukhari and Muslim Hadith Mutawatir, that have never, ever, ever been granted to anyone prior to me. That name represents him, and just like Amina, what Amina, who is Amina bin Tuahab? Amina is the one who gives the trust. She's the intermediary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to use to bring the trust from the heavens into the soul of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what Amina means, the giver of the trust. And the Prophet sallallahu for no coincidence in them 40 years, what's he known as? Al-Ameen and Al-Ma'moon. That's the names he's known by in Meccan society. His laqab is a pillage. That's why Ka'b ibn Zuhayr, the, the great poet, Ka'b ibn Zuhayr, Saqaqa bihal ma'moonu kat send rawiyatan, in his famous poem that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ultimately put a death penalty upon Ka'b ibn Zuhayr for that poem. He said, Saqaqa bihal ma'moon, speaking to his brother Bujayr in, in a famous poem, that what? The ma'moon, the one who the trust has been vested in, that's the name he used, has bewitched you, intoxicated you. Uh, look, he couldn't even, he would at least flip the word. Isn't it? Just say something else like some of the foul ones used to say. 
They used to call the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Some of them who were really far were called the Mustahzi'un. They used to call him Muthamman. Look, the name. That was Muhammad is the one praised. And Muhammad is the one who in, he is the object of intense praise. No, they tried to change the name. Muhammad, they would call him the object of intense blame, of intense rebuke. That's what he used to call him. And the Prophet says, who, who's the one that they call Muhammad? Who's the character called Muhammad? I am Muhammad. He would say, I, you're speaking about somebody else, not me. My name was given full stop, khalas. So the names are really important, very, very important. Something that we should never what, never try to what, miss. For Weber, that this is the giver of what? Of the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ultimately what? Distribute through the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That's when the al qasim in Sahih al-Bukhari. I am the apportioner, the distributor of whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. And from the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives for those who are in obedience, Allah are rewards from Allah Jalla fil Ula, Amina, Thuwaiba, Halima Sa'adiya. What's Halima Sa'adiya? Halima Sa'adiya is the giver of Hilm. Hilm, that great word. Halima means the giver of Hilm. Hilm is clemency. And she's the one who instills Hilm in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, just Hilm, what Hilm? Hilm is what? Is one of the definitive qualities of who he is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what we see in the books of all the Jews. Zayd bin Sirna in the tradition says, I was looking what? I saw all of the signs of prophecy in the face of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except two. And both of them related to Hilm. The first one that he possessed, Hilm. And the second one was that what? His Hilm would only increase when he was angered. I mean, he was looking for Hilm. And he said, this is what we took from the books of old. And also we're going to see that likewise on the Isra wal Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also increases or fortifies Hilm in the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sound hadith which we're going to find in the Sahih of Imam Muslim radiallahu ta'ala. So Halima is going to be that vehicle intermediary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses because that's the great milk. He sucks her milk for two years, two entire years. She's the one who weans him from her milk, a great individual. And the Prophet Sallallahu never forgot Halima, ever forgot Halima. <laughs> you could have seen in the, in the great battles of Hawazin, when the Prophet raises that great 10,000 army to fight the Hawazin in what's called the Battle of Hunayn, after Fath Mecca, that when they defeat the Hawazin, who Hawazin? Sa'diyah, the tribe of Sa'd, are one of the clans of Hawazin. Okay, so when the Hawazin have all been captured, they've all been captured, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting, and then a woman walks beside the Prophet ﷺ and his vision, she just speaks, she doesn't speak to him, she just sits and she begins to sing, just sing and sing and sing. And as she sings, the Prophet ﷺ begins to reminisce, because what she's singing, what are the anashid, the qasa'id that she's singing? <laughs> Those same words the Prophet used to hear when he was a child in Banu Bakr, amongst the tribe of Bakr, Sa'ad bin Bakr. He hears the songs, and the Prophet turns, and he sees that it's the daughter of Halima Sa'adiyah. She doesn't even speak to him. She just begins to sing Qasahib. And we're going to see, if you read Syria, you'll see a lot of the Qasahib that they wrote, and they used to sing to the Prophet Sa'adiyah when he was in, when he was amongst Banu Sa'ad. And when he hears it, the Prophet Sa'adiyah was salaming, he orders the hair and their entire family, because she's a captive. Free them immediately, every single one of them. Okay? So it's going to be really important that the relationship that he has, and she's a very important woman from the clan of Sa'ad bin Bakr, the tribe of Hawazin. Okay? As alluded to by her name, she becomes the principal wet nurse, Hilm. Imam Malik, radiallahu ta'ala, and he had a blessed nature. Imam Malik, Imam Darul Hijra. If you ever say the words Imam Darul Hijra, it only means one person. His name is Malik ibn Anas radiallahu ta'ala and taught in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and nobody taught besides him in that masjid. That Imam Malik radiallahu when he was seven years of age, that his mother took his turban and she began to tie the turban on Imam Malik's head and she says really beautiful words. You understand the importance of hilm? She said, Ta'allam min hilmihi qabla an tata'allam min ilmihi. She says, take from his hilm, his name is Ibn Hurmus Amash, one of the great imams of Bukhari, great imams of Hadith. He was being sent to what? To Al-Amash, to study on the, on the feet of Al-Amash. And, he, and his mother said, go take from his hilm, his clemency, which is the great sort of epitome of adab, before you take from his knowledge. 
before you take from his knowledge. Like one of the people said that I was, I spent 20 years with Imam Malik, and I was, I spent what, 18 years taking knowledge from him, and two years taking what, his adapt, just watching how he behaved. One of his great students said, and he said, I wish I'd spent the entire 20 years taking from his adapt. He said, because knowledge of Malik, you get with Malik, what be Khairi Malik, you get with Malik and other than Malik, knowledge, mashallah ta'ala, you can find with different people, but adab. Mm, it's a rare quality you only get from the fuhul, the great people. She has four children with the Prophet وسلم, drinking from the milk of his son Damra, Abdullah ibn Abdul Harith. A daughter of Shema plays a significant role in the nation of the Messenger of God. That's what we referred to before, Shema. Shema. Damra is the milk the Prophet وسلم, drinks, and that's what the two great were milks the Prophet وسلم, drinks from the, the milk of a son called Masruh and the milk of somebody called Damra. And there are really secrets which we took from our teachers that what relate to the nature of the milk. Remember Shafi used to say, ta'ala, beware of a stupid wetness. That's what he said, beware of a stupid wetness because she gives more than milk. She gives more than milk. Imam Juwaini, one of the beautiful stories of Imam Juwaini, that was Juwaini ta'ala, and his father, who's one of the great Imams of the Shafi'i school, the father of Juwaini. Uh, Juwaini, people hear of Juwaini? Mm. Remember, Juwaini is the, is, the, is the greatest teacher of Abu Hamad al Ghazali. Remember, Juwaini is the one that Nizam al Mulk built that big university called the Nizamiyah for, for Imam al Juwaini. It's called Imam al Haramain. Okay, so Imam al Haramain, his father, was also a great Imam of the Shafi'i school, considered a mujtahid of the Shafi'i Imams. And he was, he had, he, he had, to quote a long story short, because we're on the Prophet, but one of the things that he did, that he forbade the mother of Juwaini to allow anybody to what to breastfeed Imam Juwaini when he was a baby. And one day he, he comes and he finds the, the Imam Juwaini as a baby being breastfed by another woman, and he gets really mad and he snatches the baby and says, Then I forbid you from allowing any woman to breastfeed this child. Huh? Then I forbid that because this child has been reared on halal. Halal. I'm absolutely sure of that milk that you're given. As for the milk of other women, no, I want no doubt to enter into my child. And he forbade, he scolded, he scolded the mother of Juwaini for that. Okay? What's the long story? Years later, Imam Juwaini is in his 70s, the great Imam teacher of Ghazali. Ghazali is the student of the day Juwaini dies. He's why he's, he's, he's Imam, 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 he said, Imam Juwaini would sit in the dars and the great students would ask him what questions, what are called Awisa. Awisa are really difficult questions, to which Imam Juwaini would lower his head. For the moment, then he would raise his head, then he'd answer the question. And then he would later ask him, why do you lower your head when you do it? He said, lapses of memory. The answer, I, can, I know the answer, but I just have this blockage for the moment. That's why I lower my head. Then khalas, it comes, and then I, and then I, then I give you the answer. He said, what causes the lapse of memory? He asked him a Juwaini. He said two words, tilka rada'at. <laughs> That's what he said, tilka rada'at. What does tilka rada'at mean? Them drops of milk that I had when I was a baby from that woman. That was it. That affected me to my old age. Mm. The father figures, okay, inshallah ta'ala, because obviously we don't have much time, so inshallah we just cut it short. We try and go through some of the father figures, I'm very brief. Abdul Muttalib, great father figure. He's going to be the father figure for the Prophet sallallahu from the time that he is one, he is six to the time that he is eight. Because on five years of age, the Prophet ﷺ is going to be why? He's going to be taken by his mother from Halima Sa'adiya. And Halima Sa'adiya, who ordinarily the Quraysh are going to send their children to the Badia, to the desert. Because that's where what? That's where the great attributes are placed and they become men in the desert. Okay? So all is, it's, it's, it's the boys who were sent. And what? That in um, five years of age, she brings him back. And, and Amin of Wahhab is what is a standard. Why do you bring them back when you had such attachment to him? Because she first brings them back after two years of, after he's been weaned. And, and then she begs to keep the child. So why now? What, what's this sudden sort of change of heart? Quote unquote, she says to Halima Sa'adiyah, she says, the boy has an affair. Because what had taken place was the splitting of his chest. It was straight after Gabriel and Mikhail descend, split open the chest of the Prophet at five years of age. That if Damra, who's with the Prophet وسلم, who most of the milk in the Prophet وسلم, is Damra's milk, that the Prophet وسلم, even when he would drink from one of the, the breasts of Halima Sa'adiyah, and that he'd finish it, and then she would offer him the other, he would never touch it. He said, just the adil, the justice, that that one's for Damra. That's what he said, he would never touch the other one. 
Okay, because it also was with Damra's milk. So Damra becomes someone who's with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi And the ulama say the secret of the milk of Damra is that it's what? It's about the unseen will. It's from the Damr in the Arabic language, means that which is in the world of the unseen, hidden Damr. As opposed to the word Masru Sarh in the Arabic language, means that which is evident. We I mean, don't think it's Arabic. Why is one milk called the evident and the other milk called the hidden? Why? Why, why is that the names of beings? Don't think it's just arbitrary names that somehow those names mean nothing in relation to the milk that went into the breast, into the, into the internals of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. But Damr is the one with the messenger when Gabriel and, and Mikhail descend and he's freaked out. He runs immediately to his mother and says, get quickly to the Hashimi. That's what he calls him. Get quickly to that Hashimi. But I'm going to tell you, mom, when you get there, you're going to find that he's dead. Because he took hold of him and threw him down and a cotton open his chest. And Halimah, and he's white in the tradition that he is white out of fear. And she runs immediately with the husband Abu Dhabi. She They run immediately and they find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam standing. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells them what took place. It freaks her also. I mean, she's seen amazing things with the Messenger of God. And she recounts many of them in one of the most eloquent ahadith you'll ever witness. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab, the other tradition, where was your eloquence from? He said, Ru'aytu fi bani Sa'ad. Same words, my eloquence came from them people. That's where Allah taught it to me. Prophet was speaking at six months, speaking, and at eight months, kalam al fasih in the tradition. Speaking fasih, eight months, as a child, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you're going to see the imprint of that language upon Banu Sa'ad. You hear Halima Sa'adiya speak, you behave. And anyone who reads that tradition, anyone who's versed in Arabic will, will struggle to understand what she's saying. Anybody who's versed, they're going to have to need somebody who's great in Arabic, or they're going to need a lot of dictionaries surrounding them, trying to figure out what the hell is the woman saying, radiallahu ta'ala, anha. Okay, Abdul Muttalib, okay, he's after five years of age, the Prophet son is taken by his mother. That's only going to last for one year, because she's going to die in a place called Abwa. After she visits Medina to visit the grave of her husband, Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu on her way back to Mecca, she dies at a place called Abwa, just outside of what? Just outside of Medina. And note that Abwa, uh, you know, Abwa is a place the Prophet Sallallahu would constantly visit. Constantly visit the grave of his mother. Constantly. And the Sahaba would note every time he would, he would come out, his, his complexion would change. Like he'd been crying profusely always at the grave of his mother. Something that continued for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa sallam. Okay, thereafter, when Barakah takes the Messenger back to Mecca, um, Amen, that he's then placed in the, in the custody of his, of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who is the what? The chief of the Quraysh. He is the most important man in Mecca in his time. Okay, Abdul Muttalib. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hunayn and the Nabi and La Kadib and Ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am the Prophet, no lie, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. He boasts by Abdul Muttalib because he's the son of Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Talib thereafter, because of the death of Abdul Muttalib, uh, eight years of age, Prophet was eight years of age, and Abdul Muttalib dies, the great leader of the Quraysh, then Abu Talib then becomes what? The custodian of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is going to play such an important role in the life of the messenger. The messenger is 50 years of age, and to the day Abu Talib dies. Okay, from eight years to fifty years, Abu Talib. Abu Talib is the one who marries him to Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala an, alongside the Messenger of God in Jahiliyyah, as well as in Islam. And obviously that's another story. And the third of the tribesmen, i.e. those a'mam, those people who also raised the Messenger of God. And one of the things they're going to raise him is in the art of manhood, especially in the art of war. The Prophet is going to mean war is something they're going to be raised in that society. And the Prophet will talk about like the, the war of Fijar, that I partook in the war of Fijar alongside my paternal uncles. And I used to gather the arrows for them. And I used to give them the arrows whilst they were fighting in the great war. That war was between the Quraysh and Hawazin. You hear that word many times? Hawazin is, is considered a great arch enemy of the Quraysh, okay, since time immemorial. Now that's going to be set over the Messenger of God that he unites all of these different tribes. Okay? Tayyib, inshallah ta'ala. I mean, we just look at this, the different things like the environment, how the environment raised him. Because he is what? He has nurtured him. He is, he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a Nabi al Arabi. Never did I visit him except 
that I found the roof split open and the moon had descended upon him and he was converse with it, speaking to the moon. Halima Sa'adiyya, and it's not a house, it's a tent. The Bedou living in the tent, right by Ta'if, the desert. Anyone goes from Mecca to Ta'if before you ascend the mountains into Ta'if. That desert is, is where the Prophet Sallallahu was raised. Sa'ad bin Bakr, the desert of Sa'ad bin Bakr, of the Hawazin. Okay? She said, never did I visit him at night in the tents, except that I found the roof split open and the moon had descended and he was conversed with it, speaking to the moon. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sallam. He used to grow at an extraordinary rate compared to the other children, such that by the time he reached two years of age, he was a well-developed young boy. Uh, you know the hadith, that's saying Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib said, I became Muslim, and the Prophet asked him, he said, do you know why I became Muslim? And, and, and the Prophet said, why did you become Muslim? And Abbas says, because when you were a young boy, I would find that you took your finger, and you had your finger pointing towards the moon, and you were moving the moon, playing with the moon. <laughs> See, that's, that's a, it's a different age, very different age, different being, okay? Likewise, camel herders and shepherds boasted in the presence of the messenger of God. So he addressed them saying, vainglory, like pride, is the lot of the camel herder, while shepherds are characterized by tranquility and gatheredness, a sakina to al waqar He said, Moses was raised herding sheep for his family. I too was raised herd, herding sheep for my family at Jihad. He also said, no prophet has ever been sent save as a shepherd. So his, so his companions asked, and what about you? He replied, yes, I used to hate them for some people for Mecca for the wage. And that's going to be up, to, up until he's basically 25 years of age. The prophet is a shepherd and he's taking the, what, the, the, the sheep of the, of the Quraysh outside of Mecca, rearing them. And sheep are very important because in the world of symbols, dream well, you're going to dream with hadiths in Bukhari and others, in the dreams of Abu Bakr al Siddiq. That if you see a sheep in your dream, it ordinarily means a human being. You see, it means human. Okay, so the prophets, why, are they raise, why do they raise sheep? Because they're being reared, nurtured to raise, nurture human beings. Okay, that's its reality. Okay? Verily, I know stones that used to give me greetings of peace prior to prophecy. Verily, I know who they are, Allah Akbar. Can you tell them Aliya Kabla and Uba Afi says they used to do stones? Salamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Prior to prophecy. And that's what's gonna blow it in the face of those who claim that the Prophet says that you see these sort of really I don't know what they are, but they 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 I don't know what they are. It's people who analyze the seerah as if they from an academic perspective bereft of the faith and the love that is needed to approach this era. So when they approached, they said the Prophet ﷺ at 40 years of age, that he wanted to throw himself off a mountain, you see, because prophecy, what is all of this, this, that, and the other. Too many traditions, yeah, too many traditions for us what? To say that the Prophet ﷺ did not know he was a prophet before. Too many traditions, you can, that can, cannot hold. But what's the difference between knowing something and experiencing something? That's the point at 40 years of age. It's not the knowledge that he's a prophet, but it's now experiencing the reality of prophecy. And that is something that the Prophet ﷺ says, I reached a point where I thought I was about to die, lose my soul. He says, Qawl and Faqil, as Allah calls it in Muzammah, it's a very heavy word. The good wife, Khadija, Okay, that's someone who plays a really important role from 25 to 50, 25 years, silver, silver, man, silver years, with says in Khadija. And the beauty of her name Khadija, I mean, this is just beautiful. What's Khadija's name mean? Khadija in the Arabic language, it means the missing rib in a man. That's what Khadija means. The rib that is missing in the man, I do, that, the other half, the soulmate, the one that completes the man. And that's whom Khadijah al Kubra was for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She completed him. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never forgot Khadijah after her death. And anyone spoke about that, Aisha would call her the old Qurayshi woman. And the Prophet would turn very angry. What do you know about Khadijah? She protected me when no one protected me. She insisted me when everybody abandoned me, he said about Khadija. And Aisha said that was the last time I mentioned Khadija in such a way. Because he said whenever the Prophet would see friends of Khadija, he would enable them, stand up for them. 
When he's here, one time Khadija's sister would, would come into the presence of the messenger of God. He didn't see and she began to speak. And he would say, Khadija. Her voice sounded like it, it reminisced of Khadija. So Aisha seeing this, like Khadija. And she called her that old Qurayshi woman. Look at the Prophet enters into Mecca and they're all fighting. Ya Rasulullah, stay, stay in my house, stay in my house, stay in my house. What does the Prophet Islam tell the companions? Pitch me a tent at the grave of Khadija. In fact, Mecca, that's where he stays. He got the address of the Messenger of God besides Khadija in the graveyard, a tent. That's where he stays in Ma'ali, that's just a connection he had to his other half. That's why she is one of the four great women ever. Of the human history, the Prophet said, four perfect women, Fatima Zahra al Batul, who don't ever get any debates about who is the best, but Fatima Zahra al Batul is ordinarily placed as the best of them, of them four perfect women. Thereafter, the second is whom? Maryam. The mother of Jesus and Maryam, the mother of Jesus, who somehow they greater than Fatima Zahra al Batul. But dominant opinion, Fatima is greater. Most have Fatima greater. Why? Bid'atul Rasul. She's a piece of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in the Hadith of Sahih. But Maryam is the only woman who has ever been said was a prophet. Only woman that she was a prophetess. And some of the early Muslims had the opinion she was an actual prophetess. Great woman, Maryam. Great woman, huge woman. Her name, Maryam, means two men. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Dhakar kal unfa. You see that the, the male is not like the female, i.e. this female in Surah Al-Imran, not like this female, Maryam, which means two men. That's a great woman, Maryam. And who Asya, the wife, the, the wife of Fir'aun, of, um, of, of, um, of Fir wife of Fir'aun, Asya, and Khadija al Kubra, Khadija al Kubra. Okay? And two of them, and some say even more, you see the difference of opinion, were present at the Prophet Islam's bed. That's what the Saint Amir said. I saw women enter. Kabanat Abdul Muttalib. They're like the daughter. They, 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 they like the like the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. What did she mean? She meant they were really tall, commanding women. Because the daughter of Abdul Muttalib's children were very, very tall people. They were characterized by height, by having great height. And even, even the women amongst them. So she says that they were, they were like the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. The hadith says that Maryam السلام, was there as well as Asiya. There with the message of God when he was born. So Khadija is that good wife. Again, we're just going to close up here. And then the angels, we have sort of looked at, inshallah ta'ala. Maybe inshallah we'll just um, look at some questions, inshallah. Uh, what is the best way for someone who is a lot older in age and midfield? His state to seek knowledge. Okay, what's the best way for someone to seek knowledge regarding Islamic way of life? And it is, is to find a teacher. If you can't find a teacher, you have to travel for one. That's what the is saying. So the best way always to seek knowledge is to find a teacher, somebody who's versed in the religion. And somebody who's versed in the religion is somebody who studied religion on the hands of those who are versed. We change the transmission going back to the Prophet. We would never take medicine from somebody who read it from a book, would we? I want to know why Allah, what, what Allah said about race and culture. Is a Muslim man, is a Muslim man from different race and culture allowed to marry a Muslim woman from different race? What does Allah say about this? Without a doubt, somebody's the races, people can, can intermarry between races. That's, that's no, there are no doubts about that. Okay, but the primary, the primary, the primary, um, um, Attribute one looks in marriage is taqwa. Is taqwa in akramakum and Allah yet qaqum as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And that verse like Imam Malik radiallahu ta'ala and take the ala itlaq. Ala itlaq. Imam Malik radiallahu ta'ala he sees that as the essential base of, basis of what is called kafa'a. And kafa'a is what's called suitability. So if you look in the chapter of marriage in books of fiqh, every school will have the chapter of marriage and they look at the issue of kafa'a, suitability, and how is one suitable to another. Imam Malik places above everything else. Yani taqwa, that it's all about piety, okay? Others of the school, Malik is the most strongest in that. Others of the school of Jordan's we probably say that on the other end of that scale is a Shafi'i. That the Shafi'i school of law is going to, is going to taqwa without a doubt, but also they look at other things for suitability also. Like when the Prophet وسلم, said that, that a woman is married that a woman is married for her beauty and she's married for her lineage and she's married for her wealth and she's married for religion. 
take the woman of religion or your hand shall perish, the Prophet ﷺ says. Okay, the Shafi ulama who were on the other extreme of, of Imam Malik, they would they say that Naam, it's deen, take religion, no doubt. But he mentioned three other things as well. And he says they're also important once deen has been clarified, once deen has been clarified, not without deen. So for instance, the, the beauty in the eye of a beholder. Now beauty is going to be important, and obviously beauty is relative to the eye, that's what they say. As one of the poets said, the Jahiliya poets, that beauty is ultimately the eye of the beholder. So that's going to be important, first and foremost. Second is, is going to be Nasab. That's what I think what's being referred to here. Idea of race and culture. That's going to be important. Okay, it's going to be important. And the Prophet showed the importance of that in his own marriages. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although also in the marriage that he sanctioned, he also showed how that can be smashed. Like as an example, it's whom Baraka Um Ayman. Baraka Um Ayman is, an, is, a, is, a, is a slave from Ethiopia, Abyssinian descent. And who does she marry? She marries Zayd bin Haritha, who's Arab. It, it, so it smashes that, because it smashes the idea that the Arabs don't marry the non-Arabs, especially those who come from the slave class. Okay, even stronger than that, because some could say, well, Tayyip, there's Zayd, who's what, who's a slave. Well, who was Zayd's first wife? Zayna bin Jahash, blue blood Qureshi. She becomes the wife of the messenger of God. Sa'asam later, smashes that ideal, marries outside. Sayyidina Hum, Bilal ibn al-Habashi, radiallahu ta'ala, and marries a woman of noble blood, Arab, marries. And the family initially is like, the family, the father and mother are like, no, no, you're not marrying my daughter. And then as Bilal is leaving, then the daughter says, he was sent by the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's the Prophet Muhammad said, who sent this, this man to marry me. And if that's the case, I'm not going to be those who disobey his command. And then she Shimana becomes the wife of Sayyidina Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala. And Sayyidina Bilal, when he's dying, that's the same wife, loving years. When, she, when he's dying, radiallahu ta'ala, that's his wife who's shouting, wa taraba, wa taraba. What a wretched day it is today. Like her husband's dying. And saying that Bilal says, no, yari, yari, karaba, karaba, what a wretched day this is. And the saying that Bilal says, taraba, taraba, what a beautiful day it is. Then he says, Ghadan alqa muhibba Muhammadan wa Tomorrow I meet my beloved Muhammad and his people. He's prepared to die to go into the other world, saying that Bilal. So the idea of so, so, yani religion, and yani this is something we take from fiqh, but the ultimate thing, first and foremost, is religion. And thereafter, what there has to be an, an ideal of suitability. You see, because the, the, the bottom line is we, we in this age, and especially in the West, we're wretched with marriages. You see, when they give you all them statistics about the divorce rate in the non-Muslim community, we're no better, are we? Because it's the same type of divorce rate. When they give you statistics about domestic abuse, we're no better, are we? When they're going to give you statistics about adultery and what have you, we're no better. We have the same statistics, in some cases even worse, even worse than our quote-unquote non-Muslim counterparts. So the idea of understanding that marriage is still not till death do you part, but eternality, that's something we have to sort of relive. And that ultimately by ensuring that you choose what? The right woman, and likewise the woman chooses the right man. It's very, very important from the very beginning. Okay? And there are several things you take into consideration for that. Nowadays, it's just whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But why do the scholars have dispute over the way of being a Muslim? What does the way mean? Uh, and the dispute over it is, is, the, is the hadith. And the confirmation, does, does confirmation, sahih confirmation come that she became Muslim? Okay? So, the, the, the sarih, Yani, no, nothing, there's nothing they want to be sorry. There's no evident proof that she ever became Muslim the way but Islamia. Okay, so that's where ultimately where the dispute stems from. Okay. Any further questions, inshallah? No question. <coughs> I'm interested in learning about the Lohe Mahfud, the Arsh, the Saw. Where can you learn about this? I'll also add again in English. I'm not too sure about books in English. Where you can learn about the Lohe Mahfud or the Arsh or the Saw. I mean, these, these things are usually studied in Aqidah. 
So somebody studies Aqeedah, then you're going to encounter the Lawh al-Mahfuz. Okay, something we have to believe in. And the, the Imams like Imam Tahawi, the great text of Aqeedah, will discuss that. Likewise, the Arsh, these are all waiting in the Quran. The Arsh is also going to be discussed. And likewise, the soul, also the Ruh, again, these are realities mentioned in the Quran, are also going to be discussed. So ultimately, it's in Aqeedah. But what's really advised is that people usually take a teacher to learn initially about them. And thereafter, inshallah ta'ala, one can sort of read about them. I think there's a book which was, I know, it came out a while ago, which, which was an extract from Ibn Qayyim al Josia, who has a book called the Ruh, the Soul, a really fascinating book called The Soul by Ibn Qayyim al Josia. And then also they've taken from whom? Abu Hamad al Ghazali also. And I can't remember, there was a third imam, I think it was Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. I think there were three imams, they've taken the words from them with regards to things such as the soul. Uh, that, that was in English. In Arabic, obviously, there's, there's lots of works, but in English, I'm not too versed with the books that are available in English. Inshallah, whoever asks this, the second question, then you can see me after the class, Inshallah, that I can answer that one. Any further questions, Inshallah? Oh, can we ask a question of the topic? That's, that's not, uh, it's not associated with the, well, it is about shirk. Um, if somebody who's just acquiring knowledge, but they consider themselves um, ignorant in that, they don't know Akida properly yet, um, and if they were to commit certain acts um, which they don't know constitute shirk, will they be accountable for that if they were to die within the period um, before they acquired the knowledge that the act was actually shirk? Will they be accountable for that? I mean, well, and that's the assumption here is that they later come to knowledge that it is shirk? No. Basically, he's passed away now. He passes away before acquiring the knowledge that... I mean, the, the bottom line shirk. is that ignorance is not a plea. But in a court of law, in the dunya, neither in a court of law, in front of Allah SWT. Ignorance is no plea. But what if he's in the process of acquiring knowledge, but he commits... Uh, maybe he might commit mistakes. Some, somebody asked me this question, saying that, what if I commit... You know, shirk, and I don't know I've committed shirk, though I'm learning about Islam. Mm. And if I was to pass away before, you know, I realize, uh, you know. Like, what, I mean, the question is, is that even, you're using shirk, so I don't even know what you're speaking about. If, if, it's, if, it, if it's someone committing shirk, yeah. and they die upon that shirk, like real shirk, then they die as a mushrik. Like, for example, uh, like the verse in the Quran to the near meaning that. O oh, Prophet, have you not seen the one who follows, who has taken his own nafs, Hawa, I think, as his ilah? Uh -huh. And uh, it's like some scholars would state that that's like shirk, as in he's taken his own, his... Uh, it's Imam al-Ghazali, it's shirk al-Khafi, it's, it's sort of subtle shirk. So it's not the type of shirk that renders somebody a disbeliever. Right. That's a different type of shirk. So, but it's still a sin and it's something that October has to be made from. Okay, so what we're, when we think about shirk, what we read, what I really understood from shirk is a type of shirk that negates faith. Right. Somebody who dies in a state where they're committing the type of shirk, shirk is any, any polytheism, the type of polytheism to associate partners with Allah Taala that negates faith in Allah Subhanahu Taala. Somebody who dies in that state dies as a, as a, as a mushrik, uh, and, and Allah does not forgive shirk, but He forgives anything, anything other than shirk. As for shirk, which is subtle, subtle shirk. Khafi, what the Prophet Sallallahu called it, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can forgive that, okay? And most of us are in that type of subtle shirk because there's just degrees of it. It's only when we begin to study the degrees we realize that what we're in, the vast majority. Like that verse is, is a very powerful verse. It's a very powerful verse. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as an example said, the one who were, who has an atom's weight, a mifqal, a mifqal dhera, a dhera, yani like in the Arabic, dhera is like the smallest type of ant you can see. You have that type of ant's weight of, of ujub, and another riwayah kibr, and he will, will not what, enter paradise, shall not. They shall be people of hell. That, that relates to shirk. That's what ujub and kibr is all about. That's like the interpretation of that verse. It's what it's taking your passion, your desires, your want, over the want of the divine. But it's not something that necessarily negates faith. It's just something human beings ordinarily struggle to to the end of, end of their life. Imam Ghazali says the, that the, the only people who are free from that are the Siddiqeen, like Abu Bakr, the highest people of the religion. That's something we struggle with to the day we die. Okay? So as, as, as but the ultimate part, the issue is that ignorance does not appear on the day of judgment. Right. We've been commanded, and we've been commanded not to act in ignorance. Okay. That's law. 
So okay. If if a person doesn't intentionally uh, commit shirk intentionally, you know, as in associating directly partners with uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, if they do something, I don't, like you see, it's like um, I suppose it's issues of akida again, certain things which some people consider to be shirk, and it takes a person out of the fold of Islam. Other people they don't. Other scholars don't consider it to take a person out of the fold of Islam. Um, so it's like things like that that are sort of confusing. I mean, that's that's sort of rare. That's sort of rare. I mean, what you more that's it's sort of rare. You're going to have the, the scholarship of Islam considering something to be mukaffira and it, send this one outside of the fold, and others not considering it. Uh, that, that sort of you know what I mean. Can you strike an example? Like for example, the um, one one scholar he mentioned like when we ask through the blessings of Rasulullah, and he like I mean, he just said these are the people of Jahannam. Yeah, I mean that's 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 so, that's that has no basis because it, because if they're the people of Jahannam, then you placed a lot of Sahaba in Jahannam. I mean, that's that's the point. That's somebody who's speaking from basic ignorance of the religion. They, have, they haven't studied the, the time. They haven't studied the time. The Prophet Islam, his teachings, all that which the Sahaba embraced, all the practice of the Sahaba. You see, I mean, the first one to ever sort of speak out against what you're speaking about was seven, eight hundred years after the Sahaba, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ahmed Ibn Taymiyyah, and he has been refuted from every angle. By the base of why are you going to be the first one in seven, eight hundred years? It's too much, too much, too much, and I'm talking about too much, not one or two. Too much delil, which clarifies the way the Sahaba worshipped Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, okay, and that being one of the aspects that they worshipped the Prophet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through. So for that to be shirk, then you see, then you know, if you've rendered a lot of people mushriks, no, that's not going to be accepted. That's somebody who speaks without senna, you have no chain of transmission. It's broken somewhere, and ultimately what came into is their own desire, their own opinion. No, that's it's not going to be accepted whatsoever. <coughs> The hadith there in Tirmidhi and Bukhari and others, what? People make a mistake with that. Even the students of Ibn Taymiyyah himself, you mm, all made a mistake. Sometimes people can just get confused with the Within it, com our, the teacher of our teacher, he said, Nahnu fi zaman ulama. We're in a time that the scholars are confused. What about everybody else? We're in a very confusing time. Okay? So we should be careful of religion in that sense, of what you take. Religious, religious teaching, but also especially what you anchor into your heart, that becomes the belief by which you ne negotiate the world. Be careful of it. Ensure that it's something that comes from Sadr al awwal comes from the first people with transmission through to the latter generations. You have to be very careful with that regard. Especially when we live in lands and books of fiqh, and they call the yani, ba'id min al ulama that we live in lands that are far from the scholars too, and we live in lands that Islam is not is not in the soil. That's where, that's where we live, that's the context of, of, our, of our environment. Let's be very, very careful about teachings of Islam in that context. Really careful. Deenak, Deenak, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your religion. al hadar Are we up, Javid? Your time up, inshallah. Tayyip, inshallah, jazakhmun al khair. And apologies for rushing through. I think this class was a bit rushed simply because I think there's a lot to get through, but it's sort of thematic. Again, if anyone has any questions, inshallah, for the next session, inshallah, it will be good to sort of come with them questions which maybe elaborate, inshallah. Jazakhmun al khair. Thank you.